Fucking people. Are you ready to meet your fourth act of the first half? Uh, so I've just come direct from uh, University College Hospital. I had an appointment there this afternoon with my wife. Uh, we've got some news. Uh, expecting a baby, so we had our antenatal scan. Uh, don't worry, you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to make any... You're not contractually obliged to make any noises, because it's the second one. And let's be honest, nobody gives a shit about the second one. <laughs> Believe me, I know. Um, but I have just had my first nephew, who was born two days ago. Uh, so it's a special time. And I look at these two miracles of life, and I think what any normal, rational person would think, and the only thing you could think, really, is what would these babies be like if they grew up in space? You see, <laughs> you see I'm doing a PhD at the moment, so that means I spend the majority of my time uh, watching Netflix. And I've been, I've been getting particularly into a show called The Expanse. I don't know if anyone's seen The Expanse. So The Expanse is not, as I originally thought, a documentary about the large blank space on my CV where publication should go. <laughs> but it, it is actually a sci-fi thriller set a few hundred years in the future where humans are born and live in zero gravity. So I started thinking, what would that actually entail? Uh, one of my degrees is in space medicine. Sorry, that sounded really dickish, one of my degrees. Um, remember, uh, Tony Stark has got three PhDs. And uh, Sam Beckett, Quantum Leap, do you remember him? He had seven PhDs. Uh, and as a kid, I thought that was really impressive to have a bunch of, of degrees. And then when you start a PhD, you realize doing seven is possibly the stupidest idea. <laughs> anyway, so I, I floated the idea of calling my nephew Case and my, my child Control and doing some experiments on them, but my, my uh, cousin wasn't too keen on the idea. And besides, they're not even born at the same time. They're not ideal comparators. You need identical twins. And a lot of you will probably be aware that NASA did indeed have some identical twins to study. Scott and Mark Kelly are identical twins, and Scott Kelly went to spend about 11 months on the International Space Station while Mark stayed on the ground. And when he came back, I don't know if you remember these shocking headlines a couple of months ago, that Scott Kelly, his DNA had changed by 7% from his brother when he came back. Um, they said, so, you know, this is, this is shocking stuff, that there was radiation in space and it had been transformed. So what they're actually saying is that a human went into space, but a rhesus monkey came back. <laughs> because a rhesus monkey is 7% different in DNA from a human. We all share 99.9% .9 of our DNA, and identical twins, surprisingly, share 100%. What they were talking about, of course, was gene expression, which is neither here nor there in this context. So, uh, the, uh, the Telegraph, which that first headline was from, decided to double down on their stupidity and say that Scott Kelly, because of all the changes in space, may actually now be older than his twin. Now, I've got a quality that my wife is very fond of, which is I can't let any mistake go uncorrected. So I wrote to the Telegraph and I said, Scott Kelly was traveling at 17,000 miles an hour for 11 months. That is 0.0025% speed of light. Special relativity therefore dictates that he would have aged 13 milliseconds less than had he been on the ground. However, I know what you're thinking. Mark Kelly was further down Earth's gravitational well and there'd be some time dilation. I factored that in, and that's only five milliseconds over the 11 months. So therefore, he's 8.6 milliseconds younger than he would have been had he stayed on the Earth. Now, you, now, we, can, uh, we can depict this graphically. Uh, that's, that's the Earth. You can see the time, that's the gravitational well of the Earth. The time dilation is minimal. So a bigger body, Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, is, uh, is, is got much more pronounced time dilation. A, a minute on the event horizon there would be years on Earth. And this is a scientific conference, and that's, that's a, <laughs> this, this is a member of the audience, and he's just come up to the mic and said, this is more of a comment than a question. <laughs> but by that stage, you have crossed the event horizon of the question. You can't escape. And as you, and as you fall down the gravitational well, you hear him say, you may be interested in my own research. And when you reach the bottom, time actually stops entirely. Can you tell I've been at a conference all week? Uh, so, uh, if we could get... Uh, so, if we, if we had astronauts in space, could they actually uh, get pregnant? 
Uh, now, the official line from Roscosmos and, and NASA is that nobody has actually had sex in space. There are lots of rumors, but uh -huh. we, we'll take them on their, uh, on their word. However, we know that mammalian sperm actually struggles in zero gravity. We've tested a few species. Um, other species are okay, but mammals seem to have a problem. They're, the sperm don't swim properly in zero gravity. So the last SpaceX supply run, which went up a few weeks ago to the ISS, actually took bull and human sperm. See, men here are about to... Uh, <laughs> they're about to shoot their load, their payload, into space. And... Um, uh, and so right now, the ISS, they are actually testing human and bull sperm. And as you can see, they are very, very serious. About that. <laughs> <laughs> Weird, weirdly enough, Matt Groening was actually commissioned to do the mission patch. This is, this is entirely real. He did the mission patch for this, this particular mission. So when a human body... Uh, so if, if, we can't get, if we can't get pregnant in space, maybe we could send babies from Earth into space. So I, I, was, I was happy to volunteer my nephew as, as tribute, but uh, uh, we'd have to get past the ethics committee. And, and right now, uh, so I'm a cardiologist uh, by trade. I'm trying to set up a trial at the moment, and ethics committees are the bane of my life. I'm trying to recruit patients having heart attacks. And so the ethics committee say, no, you can't recruit patients when they're having a heart attack because they're going to be in immense pain. They won't be thinking straight. They can't consent. First of all, I didn't even know heart attacks were painful. But uh, uh, then I said, fine, I'll just dope them up with morphine. And they said, no, they'll have had strong painkillers, they won't be thinking straight, they can't consent. I was like, guys, it's almost as though you're not happy for me to delay a life-saving treatment with an entirely <laughs> unnecessary conversation about a trial that almost certainly won't benefit the patient in any way. <laughs> now, I may be going out on a limb here, but the inability to send babies into space or to prolong someone's heart attack is why Brexit happened. <laughs> So when you get into space, there are lots of changes to the human body. You're probably aware of some of them. Your bones lose density, they become brittle, you lose a fifth of your circulating blood volume, you become anemic, um, your muscles atrophy, your heart gets smaller, your fluid redistributes into your trunk, your uh, head gets puffy, your eyes get squashed. It's, uh, it, it, there's, there's a lot of stuff happening. So we can depict some of the, the science graphically. Um, here's a, a graph I'm sure you've all seen before. It's uh, Venus Return plotted against Pi account. But, but when I was looking at this graph, I couldn't help notice the similarities between a, a graph of stinginess, desperation, distance from the nearest alleyway, and because this graph is willingness to pay 50 p <laughs> But of course, there was a modifier that uh, shifts the dissociation curve to the left, which is here. Uh, this is a set data set from my own research. This is a, a plot of uh, a line passing through multiple point data points without actually interacting with any of them <laughs> even once. But I realise that what these points are is in fact women, and this line that, that passes through all of them without touching one at any time is of course an engineering student. <laughs> uh, I, I apologise to put such bread and butter graphs up. You, you all know this one, but this is this is blood pressure passing from the arterial to the venous system. But you know, it, it's also got a striking similarity to an analysis of this stand-up routine. Um, here's the audience appreciation on the left uh, on the y-axis in time. Here's where I told a good joke. Here's where I told a bad joke. Uh, by the end of the routine, uh, audience appreciation is at an all-time low, and you want me off the stage. And you can notice an inflection point where things started to go wrong here, and that's when I started showing graphs. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll finish off with some more very simple stuff. It's, uh, it's VO2 max plotted against age. As you can see, after an initial uh, elevation, there is an inexorable decline in all of these lines, and they just, they just keep going down and down over time. And I realized that so if you take a look closer at these lines, they are money, happiness, romance, Fondness of uh, rewriting manuscripts, appreciation of the peer review process, and the will to continue living, because of course this graph is doing a PhD. <laughs> but the sharp eyed uh, amongst you will have noticed that there is one line which rises the whole way through, uh, and that is the desire to murder. <laughs> Thank you very much.